Happy 2019, ladies and gentlemen, and yeah, I know, kept you waiting, huh? Before we start, I just want to apologize and explain why I've taken so long to get to this. Some of you may remember that I was supposed to release this review back in 2016, straight after the Peace Walker video, and it was meant to be a duo review with me and my friend Damien, since he's a big Metal Gear Solid fan too. For the most part, things were going pretty well. All the footage was recorded, and I was literally two clips away from finishing the editing. But for reasons I can't remember, I had to step away for something, which caused my external hard drive to fall to the floor and break, meaning my months of work was completely gone. I tried everything I could to get it up and running again, but it was no good. The inside of it was totally smashed, and you can guess that I wasn't in a particularly good mood that day. So as well as editing everything again, that also meant I had to replay through the entire game, which as you'll see in this video, isn't the easiest thing to do. Metal Gear Solid 5 is one of the most draining games I've ever played, and every time I would go back and re-record it, I would feel worn out after only a few missions, so I only managed to get about half of the game redone. But luckily, my younger brother Jude was still going through his first playthrough and was kind enough to do the second half of the game for me. So thank you very much for doing that, Jude. You've saved me a lot of work. Now, I actually did have a backup of the original review with the footage no longer there, but you can clearly tell it was meant to be a 2016 video. My delivery was a little different back then, and my writing style has adapted over the past couple of years, so I didn't want to give you guys a half-assed review after all this time waiting. Once again, I do apologize greatly for this review taking so long to come out, but without further ado, because we got a lot to talk about here, let's look deeply into the final chapter of Naked Snake's story and the most gigantic Metal Gear game to date, Metal Gear Solid V. Man, oh man, I think the hype for these games were probably right up there with Sons of Liberty. The trailers teased us to no end, Konami cut the prologue into its own short game, causing a lot of controversy, and just like Super Mario Maker, I watched gameplay sessions on IGN, got really excited, and then immediately felt depressed when I saw that I still had to wait several months. But as of March 2014 for Ground Zeroes, and September 2015 for Phantom Pain, Metal Gear Solid 5 arrived in shelves and met with mostly positive feedback. So the story of Peace Walker ended in sort of a cliffhanger when Big Boss found out about Major Zero declaring war against him, and thus we didn't get to see what happened next until Metal Gear Solid 5 Ground Zeroes came out four years later. It was a long time coming, but Metal Gear fans such as myself were very excited to get to play this brand new entry with updated gameplay mechanics and the promise of an open world adventure. And the gameplay didn't disappoint in the slightest, until the story was cleared in over an hour. Indeed, as you may know at this point, Ground Zeroes is nothing more than a disguised demo for what was to come in The Phantom Pain. Well, okay, it's a bit more than that. It does tie to Phantom Pain's story, acting as a prologue of some sort, but there's so little gameplay and plot that there's no other way to describe Ground Zeroes other than a demo. It's a very impressive demo, but a demo nonetheless. We'll touch on that later, though, because we have a plot to summarize, and just a forewarning, Metal Gear Solid 5 assumes that you've played both Snake Eater and Peace Walker, so I won't be dancing around spoilers for those games, but I will provide a time code for Ground Zeroes. Without further ado, let us begin with Metal Gear Solid 5. It's been about a few months since the Peace Walker incident, and the last bit of information we received was that Paz was an agent of Major Zero and his organization Cypher, and she fell into the ocean after defeating her. This time she's now a hostage, taken inside a camp owned by the new villain with the most cliche Saturday morning cartoon name Kojima could think of, Skullface. And he's the leader of a special forces unit known as XOF, a faction of Cypher that went rogue and has since been no longer in Zero's control. Paz isn't the only hostage there at the camp though, as Chico tried to save her after hearing that she got kidnapped and developed feelings towards her during the events of Peace Walker. So believing to get info on Cypher and preventing Paws and Chico from exposing MSF, Snake has to go in and rescue them both. He does just that after the one to two hour campaign and escapes with them via helicopter, but Chico discovers that Paz was surgically implanted with a bomb in her belly and Snake gets a medic to try and make audiences very squeamish at the sight of removing it without anesthetics. With the bomb taken out, Snake comes back to a burning mother base with his own men getting slaughtered by XOF who discovered their location anyway, but just about manages to storm through and save Kaz. You see, there was supposed to be a UN inspection for nuclear weapons held at MSF, but it turned out to be nothing more than a distraction to allow XOF to ambush them 
them. And then upon regaining consciousness, Paz reveals that there's another bomb somewhere in her body, most likely her womanly regions, but she jumps off of the helicopter just before the bomb explodes inside her, which causes Snake's helicopter to spiral out of control and crash into a pursuing XOF helicopter. The game ends on a cliffhanger with a post credit scene of Skullface forcefully getting Paz to reveal the whereabouts of Major Zero. Yeah, that's pretty much it for Ground Zero's story. Like I said, there's not really a lot to get invested in. It is heartbreaking to see Mother Base burn after putting so many hours into it in Peace Walker, and at the time, the cliffhanger ending was quite a surprise, but aside from that, there isn't much to go on in Ground Zero's. Unlike the other Metal Gear Solid games where cutscenes would overshadow the gameplay, both Ground Zero's and The Phantom Pain have more focus on gameplay than the cutscenes, which is brilliant for newcomers and players who weren't fans of the long cutscenes. But the stories deteriorated from quality as a result. More on that when we get to The Phantom Pain. Ground Zero's campaign may be short and lacking in an engaging story, but in terms of how the game plays, it's pretty good. You can't do as much as you can in The Phantom Pain, but what we've got here is good on its own. Snake's got a couple of new moves he can use now. He can roll left and right in case you're approaching danger, and he can dive out of the way, which helps when you're milliseconds away from being caught. I don't use either that often, but it's handy when it's needed, and it becomes slightly more useful in Phantom Pain. Even if you do get caught, though, then this introduces you to a new mechanic to the Metal Gear series called Reflex Mode. When you're spotted, the game slows down for a few seconds, giving you a chance to get rid of the guard that saw you before any alarms are set off. This is an excellent addition to the series. The only thing you need to worry about is having a good aim, and it makes sneaking around far less stressful and frustrating. And if you don't want to use reflex mode, then you could just turn it off. Simple as that. Vehicles are also a brand new inclusion to Metal Gear Solid 5. Again, they're not as useful in Ground Zeroes as they are in The Phantom Pain, but since the camp is so big, it makes traveling around a lot more comfortable. But easily one of the best tools in the history of Metal Gear is Snake's upgraded binoculars to scout ahead and pinpoint enemy locations, heavy weapons, or vehicles. Considering what you're up against, it's pretty much essential if you want to have a smoother time sneaking around the camp. The binoculars encourage you to think about your strategy and how you approach the base. If you want to hide in a truck to sneak further into the enemy headquarters, you can. If you simply want to go in guns a-blazing, you can. If you want to turn out the lights to temporarily blind enemies, you can. Those are just a few of the options available. There are tons of ways to completing your objective, which increases replayability, and this is only the prologue. It really is amazing how much effort and freedom Konami's given to this short demo, and after you've completed the main game, you can take part in side missions that all use the same map, but have different objectives to accomplish. The Deja Vu and Yame Vu missions are the ones that are given the biggest treatment, however. They used to be console exclusives when Ground Zeroes came out, but now you can get both no matter which platform you have this game on. I was actually rather disappointed with the Deja Vu mission because all you do is recreate moments from the original Metal Gear Solid, which is cool at first, but it doesn't do well for multiple playthroughs. Especially the quiz at the end of it based on MGS1, where you can't get an answer wrong if you want to unlock the skins of PS1 Solid Snake and Gray Fox. That was extremely annoying. The Yame Vu mission's a little better in my opinion. Raiden, somehow traveling back in time, needs to figure out which guards are body snatchers and kill them, or be penalized if he kills someone who's quote-unquote innocent. Sprinting around the base is pretty fun too, you could just run to a guard and then WHAM! SACKED! The side missions themselves are alright, nothing fantastic, and they don't have any redeeming story elements to it. They range from assassinations to sabotages, but I really didn't like this helicopter level because it's nothing but shooting, it can be rather difficult to aim while flying around. It shows how Metal Gear really doesn't sue being a third-person shooter. The Hideo Kojima cameo was cool, but it's not worth all the hassle rescuing him. But that's Ground Zeroes in a nutshell, not much more to add. The gameplay's stellar, but there's so little content that it wasn't worth the original $30 it was being sold for. Oh yeah, this game costs $30 dollars when it was first released. Nowadays, you can get it for around 5 to $10, both digitally and physically, and it's even included in the definitive experience with all the rather mediocre DLC for both games. But most people weren't very pleased with the cut-down game at full price, and rightfully so. To put salt on an open wound, as many of you will know at this point, Kojima and Konami had split during the development of Phantom Pain due to many disagreements, meaning that this could well be the last Metal Gear game we'll ever see from Kojima. I mean, he does need a break after making them for 30 years, and he's got his independent studio now, so there could still be a chance he doesn't want to say goodbye to Big Boss just yet. But back to the game at hand, consumers had to squeeze all they could out of Ground Zeroes for 16 months after the teasing cliffhanger, before the long-awaited second part of the story in Metal Gear Solid V The Phantom Pain. Now before we talk about Phantom Pain's story, I strongly recommend getting both this and Ground Zeroes on either the PlayStation 4 or the Xbox One, or the PC version if you have the specs for it. The PS3 and 360 versions aren't bad, but they don't run in 60 FPS, and draw distance can be an issue sometimes. Even with the 7 generation copies though, Metal Gear Solid 5 has some gorgeous graphics. No doubt the best looking Metal Gear games to date. They both take advantage of the new Fox engine, and it's very impressive how games this big are able to run so smoothly. This is going to be a nitpick, but the only thing I'm not crazy
crazy about his snake's ponytail. It's a style that doesn't suit him, and the strands of hair are rather blocky for a game that came out in 2015. You know, the drills skip to this time code here if you don't want to see the plot unfold until you finish the game. Carrying straight on from Ground Zeroes, Big Boss wakes up in a hospital where he's approached by a doctor who explains to him that he's just woken up from a nine-year coma. He also has a large shard from the helicopter crash stuck to his skull and had to have plastic surgery because of the severe damage from the explosion, and his left hand's not looking too good either. Let's give him a hook. That ought to do it. But the biggest shock to Snake is that his voice actors changed from David Hayter to Kiefer Sutherland. Well, actually, that change was made since Ground Zeroes, but I couldn't find a clever segue to talk about it. I don't really mind Kiefer Sutherland being the new voice for Snake as much as I love David Hayter, but his performance doesn't feel much different to 24's Jack Bauer, which may be a problem to some. Not that it matters much anyway, Snake barely carries out a full sentence in this game, and I get it could be because Sutherland's an expensive actor, but in the past, Snake could hold a conversation that didn't even need to be related to the mission. Here, though, throughout 90% of the game, Big Boss is a freaking mute. However, to his credit, Sutherland's voice does suit Fan and Pain's more serious tone compared to its predecessors. This is undoubtedly the darkest game in the lineup, starting as soon as the opening hospital section. The more whimsical moments are very few and far between, which honestly I think drastically decreases the charm of the series, and the characters just aren't fun anymore. I'm getting ahead of myself anyway. After some time passes, an assassin arrives in Snake's hospital ward where she gets burnt by a man with bandages on his face who calls himself Ishmael. Together, Snake and Ishmael try to escape the hospital, but keep confronting XOF patrol units on the lookout for Snake and kill everyone that crossed their path. On our way out, we also come across the two major side villains of the game known as the Man on Fire and the Third Child. And for those of you who've played MGS 1 and 3, yes, these two are exactly who you think they are. Hope you like this hospital, by the way, because you're going to be here for a whole hour. God, isn't this riveting. Five hours later, Snake and Ishmael escape the hospital but end up in a car crash where Ishmael seems to have disappeared upon waking up. Snake then comes across Revolver Ocelot as he helps him escape from the man on fire before welcoming him back to a rebuilt mother base with his new crew called the Diamond Dogs, under the leadership of Kaz after rescuing him from Skullface's goons. He's lost an arm and a foot because of him too, so he's pretty hell-bent on getting his revenge. Despite just being in a nine-year coma, Snake, now called Venom Snake, springs back into action with his new robotic arm and immediately goes to do various missions to stop the returning Skullface from Ground Zeroes, now with a Lone Ranger mask for some reason. And as expected, he has his own Metal Gear-ish nuclear weapon called Sahelanthropus, essentially Rex from MGS1 with large limbs and somehow more advanced, despite this being further back in the timeline. And from here on out is a bunch of shenanigans that all intertwine with Snake and the Diamond Dogs in some form or another. One instance involves you rescuing a bunch of African war children led by a not-at-all-subtle cameo from a young Liquid Snake who's called Eli in this game. There's another subplot with Huey confusingly working working for Skullface and possibly being responsible for greenlighting the UN inspection in Ground Zeroes and caused the ambush to happen in Mother Base nine years ago. And Huey does an extremely terrible job lying about it, but we'll get to that near the end of the synopsis. The biggest subplot of the bunch, however, has to go to this sharpshooter named Quiet, who can disappear whenever she pleases, runs very fast, and fitting with a name she never speaks. She can do all of this because she holds a form of parasites that's sort of like the predecessor to nano machines, and were created by this really old guy called Kotok who wants to right his wrongs and help Snake stop Skullface. Wonder why Quiet's practically naked all the time? Get a load of this. She apparently breathes through her skin and putting on clothes would suffocate her. Oh, but wearing a bra, underwear, and tights, she's totally fine. I'm smelling bullshit and it stinks really bad. Other than her, though, there's also a virus outbreak in Mother Base that infects the throats of anybody who speaks in English. This is Skullface's master plan in the game, to rid the world of the English language for purposes that are very confusing. You get a tremendously long-winded speech during his final moments, but most of it is very hard to follow. It doesn't matter in the end, though, because Sahelanthropus gets hijacked by young Psycho Mantis here as they go on a rampage and Snake has to take them on. Sahelanthropus is destroyed and the third child miraculously disappears as Skullface is crushed and bleeding to death, and Snake does a bad got job healing his wounds. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is only chapter one of the story. Yes, just like in Guns of the Patriots and Peace Walker, the story is split into chapters. Well, two chapters this time. Chapter two, though, has a lot of stuff just happen. Skullface is dead at this point, and Sahelanthropus has been taken to Mother Base to be used by the Diamond Dogs, while the third child gives Eli a vial of the English-speaking parasites. What else is there to do? I know, let's make the players do some of the exact same missions again with more difficult stimulations, and just show more cutscenes whenever we feel like it. But 
crap. What can we do to meander a bit longer? Got it. Let's have Eli and the African children steal Sahalanthropus for themselves, which should be top priority for Snake and the others to take it back, but apparently not. Don't worry, we'll cover that too. Next, let's not surprise anyone when it's revealed that Colonel Volgan from Snake Eater was the man on fire, but have it mean nothing other than fan service and never show him again after that little detail. Ah, oh, but that's not enough. Let's release a plague full of those mutated parasites forcing Snake to kill many of his throat-infected men to stop the disease from spreading, afterwards turning them into diamonds to always carry around with him. Oh, and now we'll have Huey show his true colors as it turns out that he's the cause of the epidemic and not only wanted to sell the parasites as weapons, but he also murdered his wife Dr. Strangelove after arguing about using their son Hal for experiments. I'm not exactly sure where this sudden change in Huey's character came from since Peace Walker, but he's a real bastard in this game. And it serves him right when Big Boss chooses to banish him into the ocean rather than going with Cause's plan of shooting him on sight. Huey is left to fend for himself, but he doesn't matter anymore because Quiet has now suddenly disappeared. Big Boss manages to find her in a short time though and sees that she's been kidnapped by Soviet mercenaries who did the sacrilegious deed of putting clothes on her. The bastards. Quiet does eventually kill the guards and breaks free and after she and Snake take care of an oncoming Russian army, by the way upgrade those rocket launchers and Fulton recovery systems because they will seriously kick your ass if you don't. I hated this part so much. It took me two and a half hours to plow through these guys on my first playthrough. They just kept coming and coming. And if the helicopter riot in Ground Zeroes didn't convince you that Metal Gear Solid games don't make for good third person shooters, this most certainly will. Well, afterwards, the two run into a sandstorm where Big Boss is bitten by a snake and loses consciousness from the venom, so Quiet has to now speak in English to direct the rescue helicopter and save Big Boss, sacrificing her life in the process. However, Quiet decides to not return to the Diamond Dogs and walks into the distance to avoid another epidemic happening after her time with them has made her defect to Snake's side, and not really a shock, but she was also the assassin that confronted him in the hospital. Speaking of which, we now have the secret final part of the story where you have to play through the entire hospital section again for no reason other than past Adding, while Kojima, being the end night Shyamalan of video games, couldn't end Big Boss's story without one last twist. We were never playing as Big Boss the whole time. We were instead the medic that survived the helicopter crash in Ground Zeroes and had to have plastic surgery and hypnotherapy to look like a decoy of Big Boss, or a phantom as the game calls him for the war against Cypher. And as well as that, he's also the Big Boss that Solid Snake fights in Metal Gear 1 on the MSX2. The real Big Boss was actually Ishmael in the hospital, but after he escapes and meets up with Ocelot, we're never told where exactly he's going. We know that the whole world is after his head, but he just gets on his motorcycle and rides away, only to make a reappearance in Metal Gear 2. I don't know if this plot twist is either genius or incredibly stupid. The major issue is that while this does explain how Big Boss survived his ordeals in Metal Gear 1, a tiny story thread that people probably stopped caring about for 30 years, that means the real Big Boss never progresses as a character since we were never playing as him. This entire game was supposed to establish how Big Boss became the bad guy we'll come to know in Solid Snake storyline, but in the end, nothing has been a accomplished. Phantom Pain's story feels smaller and less significant to the bigger picture. Not to mention that this is a big slap in the face when we're told that it's not Big Boss who killed a large sum of his own troops, and it wasn't Big Boss who Quiet gave her life to save. Not to say that the Phantom should have been cut entirely, but when you're trying to develop Big Boss as a character, you need Big Boss in the game to develop. Having to gun down your recruits to save them any more harm was one of the most powerful moments I had ever experienced in a Metal Gear game. You could sense the guilt and anger inside of Big Boss for having Skullface and XOF force him to do that, and it wouldn't have actually been a bad ploy to make Big Boss the villain later in the timeline, but since he was never there, well, you get the idea. Maybe they're just trying to hammer in that it wasn't Big Boss who made everything possible in this game, it was really you, the player, all along, but that's a very half-assed way to bring that message across. Metal Gear Solid 2 did it right with virtual reality, so why couldn't there have been something similar in Phantom Pain? Something to screw with the player's mind and question what's real. Well, okay, scratch that, it is screwing with the player's mind in a way, but not for a good reason. It just feels like Kojima wanted to make a twist for the sake of having a twist, regardless of how it would impact the rest of the series. Whether or not it was because of the feuds between him and Konami, we'll never be sure, and that's why we never got the third chapter that was supposed to be in the game, but got cut at the last minute. This was going to involve Snake locating an infected Eli along with the African kids and Sahelanthropus in a contaminated island, and there was meant to be a pretty epic battle between Sahelanthropus and Snake with assistance from the Diamond Dogs, maybe a more expansive version of the Metal Gear Zeke fight from Peace Walker. I really would have loved to see this in action, but sadly it wasn't meant to be. And after the battle against the concept,
that dart's been won, Sahalanthropus just gets taken back. The Diamond Dogs leave Eli, the third child takes the parasite out of him and helps him escape the island before it gets set ablaze, all ending with Eli swearing for vengeance leading up to the events of Metal Gear Solid 1. It's not a brilliant ending, but it would have been a hell of a lot better than what we've got now, and unfortunately it doesn't look like there's a chance of it appearing as DLC. There's a video of the full chapter on YouTube, so check it out if you're ever interested. It may seem like I've been skipping a lot of the story's details, but this is really all that's there. Phantom Pain doesn't have much of a story to go on, certainly more so than Ground Zeroes, but compared to the other games, it falls incredibly short. Cutscenes are nowhere near as abundant as they've been previously, and some of them aren't all that lengthy or even relevant. By reducing the amount of cutscenes, you're taking away one of the biggest things that made Metal Gear games stand out from the crowd. Remember in my other end review when I mentioned how the linearity almost stripped away the core feature to any Metroid game? That's precisely how it is with Phantom Pain and its cutscenes. I can respect that it's to introduce Metal Gear games to a newer crowd, but with the story carrying on from Snake Eater and Peace Walker and providing nuances from Solid Snake's storyline, why would they want to start here? They'd be totally confused. I mean, granted, Phantom Pain has a basic story altogether, but you'd be missing out on so many details that the past games foretold. Most of the fluff in the story comes from the returning audio tapes that expand the character characters and further explains what's going on. Like we find out that Amanda became a war hero since Peace Walker, Dr. Strangelove mysteriously went missing, and despite taking the time to rescue him, Chico apparently died during the crash in Ground Zeroes. Where Cecile during all of this? That's a very good question, but I don't think she would have added much to the story anyway. As for Major Zero, who oh boy. So in spite of being Big Boss's longtime rival and the cause of everything that's happened in this goddamn series, we never actually see him in this grand finale. He's been demoted to audio recordings that you can't unlock until getting the true ending. Considering how important of a role he has in this series, I don't understand why they put him aside as recordings that you can optionally listen to. Not to mention the subject matter for these recordings are pretty tragic. Skullface poisons Zero with the parasites which causes him to be very sick and there are even tapes of him talking with Kaz and Ocelot and confronting the comatose big boss at the hospital. He explains that he actually feels guilty about the two of them falling out over what the boss wanted and seeing how he becomes a vegetable by the time he meets meets up with Big Boss again in Metal Gear Solid 4 and never gets to tell him all of this now that he's awake? That's extremely upsetting. This could have really benefited Phantom Pain's story if they portrayed this with cutscenes, but as is, it's not nearly as powerful because we don't see Zero's expressions and feel what he feels. He could be saying this with an evil smirk on his face for all we know. And just like in Peace Walker, all of this happens during the story missions that you need to partake in to get deeper into this game's minuscule plot. But you can also take the time to do side operations that you unlock upon completing more story missions and side ops. Metal Gear is also now a sandbox game, giving you complete control as to what you want to do. You could head to your destination to find out what happens next in the story, or you could take a quick detour and complete that side op right next to it. Maybe you'd like to recruit some more diamond dogs, or even use Fulton Recovery on Wandering Wildlife and turn an entire strut of your new and improved mother base into a barn. But if you want some downtime after a hard day of sneaking, you can freely run around mother base, interacting with your soldiers, and unlock some hidden cutscenes. We can actually step in the damn thing now. It's not something I do personally, but I'm sure if people can find joy in walking around Lara Croft's mansion, they'll somehow find entertainment in Mother Base. You can do target practicing missions, that's fun, right? But this base is needlessly gargantuan. Why are these connecting bridges so freaking long? It takes forever to get to another part of the base, even with your jeep or your goddamn helicopter. On a side note though, at least it's hilarious to raise your army's morale just by beating the crap out of them. Why, good day to you, sir. Hello, miss, you're looking quite lovely today. Have you seen my dog? He's so cute. Tell me he He's cute. Although, speaking of dogs, I should introduce another new ingredient to the Metal Gear formula, the buddy system. Before you go out and do more missions, you can decide to bring along one of four buddies, each helping Snake in different ways. The D-Horse, for instance, lets you travel faster across the wide areas. D-Dog or DD can sniff out enemies and traps. The D-Walker is good for travel as well, but can also be modified with all sorts of exclusive weapons and tools. And finally, Quiet will eventually join you and scout ahead for enemies, and can also take anybody out at your command. She's quite helpful if you get spotted too, because there's a chance you'll get rid of the guy that's seen you. Most players tend to use D-Dog the most, but I actually prefer using Quiet. DD is very useful for sensing enemies and prisoners that Quiet can't see, but if I get spotted, there's nothing he can really do to help. Quiet, on the other hand, can save my life if I'm caught, so I'll definitely use her instead, even if it means I can't stop her annoying humming. Plus, I don't think when I throw a grenade, D-Dog can shoot it into a helicopter, causing it to burst into a fiery explosion. As for the other companions, the D-Horse is alright, but he becomes redundant 
once you can deploy vehicles. It is laugh out loud funny though when you get him to take a dump in the middle of the road and that actually causes the enemy's jeep to slide all over the place. The D-Walker's probably my least favorite of the buddies, it just makes too much noise to be handy. Useful for combat situations, but it's next to worthless when it comes to stealth no matter how many upgrades you give it. Which brings me to my next point. In addition to building equipment for yourself, you can also develop gear for your buddies too, so for example, you can make Quiet look like the Golden Girl, though personally I prefer covering her in blood to make enemies fear her. Sadly, there aren't any wacky weapons to build unlike Peace Walker, with the exception of the rocket arm that I absolutely love using to knock out enemies. I also like using the water pistol that can actually defeat the man on fire during his boss fight. And speaking of boss fights, there actually aren't that many of them, and unfortunately they're not the best in the series. They don't feel as grand or epic as I would have liked. Still, even the boss battles give you a lot of choices as to how you want to beat them. Do you choose to crush Sahelanthropus with a good old rocket launcher, or do you call in a tank to make things a little easier? Do you want to use Fulton Recovery on the man on fire, or do you want to douse those flames by shooting at an exploding water tank? It's the same when it comes to sneaking too. If you thought Snake Eater and Guns of the Patriots gave you a lot of freedom, Phantom Pain blows those two titles out of the water and then some. This includes placing posters on your cardboard box to lure some guards and pose as a sexy model. I guess these guys really don't mind flat personalities. Or you can upgrade your Fulton Recovery so that it takes away heavily armored vehicles and large crates storing minerals for Mother Base. Hell, if you wanted to, you can create wormholes as Fulton Recovery, so you no longer have to worry about those pesky ceilings bothering you. Why you could use Fulton Recovery indoors in Peace Walker, but now suddenly can't do that here, I won't understand. Though I imagine the game would tell me, Nano Machine, son. Anyway, aside from the hospital during the opening, there are two locations you can go to, Afghanistan and Africa. Both are utterly gigantic, but apart from the wildlife and occasional enemy outposts, the areas contain a whole lot of empty space that doesn't need to be there. What would take Peace Walker only a couple of minutes to finish a side off could take 10 to 20 minutes in the Phantom pain, maybe even longer. Most of that time is either just waiting for your helicopter to land no matter if you're starting or ending a mission, or driving around these desolate wastelands for an ungodly long amount of time before reaching your destination, which is even worse if you choose to sprint your way there. Long traveling is not only required for the story, but this also applies to the side ops, and there are 157 to complete. So if you're fully completing this game, you're going to need much, much patience to get through them. And I don't know how I did, but I did it. I finished all all of the side missions, and let me tell you folks, that was the most exhausting thing I've ever done in a Metal Gear game, even more so than doing the extra battles in Peace Walker. I unlocked so much stuff in the game, I upgraded Mother Base to its maximum limit, but it just got more and more expensive to develop gear, further expand the Diamond Dogs, and deploy myself with said gear to this giant world. Almost everything you use will cost Gross Military Product, or GMP, which is Peace Walker's and Phantom Pain's currency. This includes requesting for a new item, swapping buddies, ordering an airstrike, and calling in the helicopter that will increase in price the more upgrades you give it. Even using Fulton Recovery costs an albeit small amount of GMP, but since you'll be doing it so often, you won't even realize how much money has actually been spent near the end of the game. What also didn't help when completing the side ops was that they were all almost exactly the same and are nowhere near as varied as they were in Peace Walker. Side missions in that game consisted of stuff like using C4 to blow up crates and collect the contents inside, dates with Paws and Kaz, defending bases, going through the mission, without getting caught, and taking on the Monster Hunter bosses. Phantom Pain's side ops are all just rescuing prisoners and neutralizing enemies and their vehicles, with the only different ones being putting legendary animals to sleep and extracting them, and bringing back troops from the Ground Zeroes incident nine years ago. They're extremely repetitive and wears on your brain after investing so many hours into the game. Phantom Pain is hella long. It took me around 60 hours to finish the story with only a portion of the side ops done, and I probably spent an extra 30 to 40 hours just finishing everything else. Put some music or podcasts on to stop yourself being on autopilot, or at the very least have a listen to the many audio tapes you have access to to give you more background to the characters and the story. Oh look, they've actually given you some licensed 80s tunes if you're bored. I'm a snake in Afghanistan, whoa. I'm a snake in Afghanistan, whoa. All of you are gonna die under my hand. It's particularly frustrating and boring when you come across enemy bases that are about as big as they were in Ground Zeroes, and they suddenly decide checkpoints shouldn't be a thing. Now, Ground Zeroes had a very generous checkpoint system that made sneaking around all the less stressful if you got caught. If things ever got too hectic for you, you just needed to pause the game, restart from the nearest checkpoint, and you're given another chance. Phantom Pain's checkpoints can sometimes be just as kind, but most of the time it's unreasonably harsh when going through the bigger strongholds. You could be spending close to half an hour carefully and quietly snail-pacing your way through the 
enemy's defenses, but if you just slightly mess up and die, you have to start from the base's entrance again, which is the absolute worst. And it doesn't get any better when doing all of the side ops because you have to keep revisiting these gargantuan bases and it gets more and more infuriating each time. When you're not slogging through the game though, you can also participate in some online multiplayer, but it's nothing we haven't seen in other shooters. Just your basic team deathmatch and survival modes, and you can also earn experience points with each kill to unlock more weapons and abilities. I do somewhat miss the co-op from Peace Walker, but in the end, that's not what's necessary in a Metal Gear game. I'd rather have a fun single-player experience rather than a game that sorely relied on other people to help you. <laughs> There's no point spending more money on a PS Plus or Xbox Live Gold membership just for multiplayer that neither offers much or has a very big player count to begin with. PC users don't have this problem, though they had to wait a little while for multiplayer to be released. What's free to play on all platforms, however, are the FOB missions, which are a little better. You simply invade the bases of other players and steal some of their troops without getting caught. Good for if you want to be a dick to your friends. But did they really have to add microtransactions for extra bases? What made Konami stoop so low to include microtransactions and a Metal Gear game before Metal Gear Survive came out? You know what's almost as annoying as microtransactions though? Putting opening credits at the beginning of each story mission. It's become rather infamous that because of the quarrels between Kojima and Konami, Kojima felt as if he had to remind people constantly that he made the Phantom Pain. Be prepared to see his name in print more times than Tommy Wiseau's in the room. The opening credits can even spoil the surprise to what's ahead. Well look at that, we're meeting up with Skullface and the third child. Now the tension and suspense is completely gone. Jeez Louise, how does this game add so much but somehow add less at the same time. There are actually a number of good things to say about the Phantom Pain, but the bad stuff is too noticeable to ignore. If I had to describe the entire experience in only a single word, it would be unfinished. Phantom Pain can be downright amazing to play at times, but it has no business being 50 to 60 hours long just to finish the lackluster story. The pacing in the first chapter is incredibly slow, and even when there's more interesting stuff going on in the second chapter, it all ends with one of the most disappointing endings the Metal Gear series has ever had. The voice acting's still pretty good, but Snake himself doesn't say a whole lot. It's mainly Ocelot that does all the talking, and I get tired of his flat voice by the end of the game. Troy Baker, you're a great actor, but I think this is one of your weakest performances. Also, if you recall in my review of Peace Walker, I said that the game gets better after you finish the story, but here it's pretty much the opposite. The story missions can be rather enjoyable and some of them are fairly unique, but eventually you'll notice a pattern with them, especially the side missions, and it wears out its welcome fast. The gameplay is the strongest point, but there aren't a variety of objectives, just how you approach the missions themselves. So you're basically doing the same thing over and over again, and to this day, I've still not completed the game 100%. It takes way too damn long to do, and I just can't be bothered right now. I know there are people that have done it, but I'm just gonna take it slow for now and never do it again once I do. This game has already taken over 100 hours of my life just for doing all the story missions and side ops, and I can't believe I'm only 75% done. For some fans, this could still be the best game you'll play in the series, and it's definitely worth giving a shot. You may find something in it that I don't, just don't expect to beat it in a weekend. Well, that does it for the canon Metal Gear games, all that's left are the spin-offs. I already covered Metal Gear Rising during the Platinum Games Marathon, so I guess coming up next is either Metal Gear Ghost Babble for the Game Boy Color, or maybe Portable Ops since I've got a PlayStation TV now, but neither of those are going to be in the next video. I think it's time to start doing the Devil May Cry reviews in celebration of the fifth main entry coming out soon. Now, this isn't going to be a marathon of sorts, but I'll go further into detail when we begin. That is if I'm not busy with Kingdom Hearts 3. Only a few days to go, I'm so excited. I'll see you guys then, and take care.